So today is about choice. Um, the story of the gospel, the, the narrative of what God has been up to for all of creation began in the garden and it began with a choice. And what it, if you remember the story, God created a garden, he put man in the garden, said you're welcome to eat anything. There was no shame, there was no hiding, there was no rebellion. It was a peaceful place of absolute provision. And, uh, but there was one thing that God put in the garden and he put this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he didn't put a fence around it, he just put a prohibition around it and said, don't eat that. The day you eat it, you're going to die, so don't go near it, don't touch it, you'll die. And so over the years as a pastor, I've had all kinds of people ask me, so what's up with that? Why would a God of love, why would a wise God put a tree in the garden where, we, where Adam could have blown it or whatever? And um, that's a good question. It's a fair question. I don't know the total answer because I don't know God, the mind of God, but, but I believe one of the reasons is is because choice is important. Without choice, we're not sure what we have. I mean, when you think about it, choice is what makes uh, relationships work well. It's what makes relationships valuable. When we're forced into something, or when we don't have a choice, it, you've heard the term, it's a crass term, but the term shotgun wedding, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this image of a father <coughs> standing there while the guy says his vows, right? Well, that's not a loving, warm picture, is it? Oh, they were just so in love. I'm not sure if they were in love. Could have been fear, could have been bribe, but it was anything but choice, right? And so choice really helps us, the, 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 the fact that there is choice helps us understand a little bit the value of relationships. We like to keep our options open. We like to be you know, broad in our ability to choose and not be narrowed down to any one thing. That's why it's almost impossible to get people in the Northwest to commit with an RSVP. Like if you've ever had a wedding, work. and you're like, would you please let yeah. me know if you're coming? Well, I'm gonna wait till the know. last day. I'm gonna see how I feel on that day. Like, what are you no, having? I, what I kind of food you serve? I, 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 you come, and I'll tell you what I'm gonna feed you. Yeah. And it is a hard thing to do, but that's what makes a wedding so special, right? There aren't four, five, six women walking down there. There's one woman walking one down bride. the aisle in a white dress. She's here today, actually. I'm not sure why. <laughs> uh, in a white dress, and and that's like I choose you. This is not, not any of those other bridesmaids, and she's not picking of all the guys in the same exact suit at the front, but I choose you. But what we want to do is we want to keep our option open and say, I want to have that and this. That's called syncretism. Syncretism is a world, maybe, maybe you've heard it before, it's not used a whole lot, but it's, it's used quite often in missions because what it is is this, the combination of different forms of belief or practice. Now, uh, some forms of belief and practice actually can mingle. They can, they can share space and they don't butt heads. But Christianity simply won't do that. It won't share space or ideology with any other way of seeing the world. It is very singular in that regard, regard and that's why it often is called intolerant. Like, ah, oh, you're, just, you're just intolerant. You, you believe in Jesus as the only way. And that, um, again, it falls on our North American ears is exactly that, just too narrow-minded. Can't there be many ways? And so syncretism has a cousin called uh, pragmatism, which is this idea that whatever it is, whatever it takes, I'm going to make it work. So I'm going to take your hard belief system and I'm going to make it work in my life because I've encountered things now that the Christianity doesn't fit my belief system. And those of anybody in the room who's been involved in missions understand syncretism because it's, it's again, in, in many nations where there's perhaps been animist religion or, or folk religion. Uh, from where Anna is from, I know Oaxaca. And so in the mountains, tons of people have beliefs that date back centuries and centuries. No one even knows where they got them. And then the Catholics marched across, the conquistadores marched across and kind of conquered as they went. And so people have combined Catholic belief with animist belief. And so they have all these practices, the mixing of two religions. Well, that's not just for, for backward places or country places or mountain places. We do the exact same thing. We take a little bit of Jesus and, and oftentimes a little bit of kind of Hindu thought and a little bit of Buddhist thought and a little bit of New Age thought. And we just kind of, we 
pragmatism. We make it work. We, we just say, oh, that's how my life runs. And so in the same breath, we can, on Facebook, ask for prayer and then ask for good thoughts and then ask, pray for some good karma. It's like, what in the world are we doing, right? Well, we're, we're taking these things. We're using terms of belief systems. We're mixing them all together for our hopefully a good outcome. So Jesus is going to give us four examples here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we're at. We're at the end. He's going to give us four examples, and each one is very binary. It's, it's one or the other. It can't be both. And he starts out right here with two gates. So we're in Matthew 7, verse 13. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So there's only two ways he's saying. There's two gates, and they lead to two roads. One road is very broad. It's very easy to get onto, but it leads to a certain destination. It doesn't just go anywhere. It leads to what? Destruction. There's another road, and you enter through a very narrow gate to get on that road, and it is indeed a very narrow road, but it leads to life. Think of it this way, if you could. If you picture a funnel uh, that's wide at one end and narrow at the other, this is kind of how it looks. What Jesus is, 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 I believe, speaking about here, and what helps us understand is, imagine if the funnel was this way and we were coming in at the wide end. And what happens is, is we're, as we go down the funnel, so I come into this funnel, yes, in a moment of pain or in my moment of court, <laughs> my court day, or my, when I finally land at the bottom of my, come to the end of myself, yes, I want Jesus, but, but I don't want to let go of my, <laughs> my, my habits. I don't want to let go of my unsaved uh, boyfriend or girlfriend. I, I don't want to let go of my other beliefs. And so I want to bring all my baggage, but I want Jesus too because you seem like such nice people and, and I have a good vibe here or whatever. And so we, we, we kind of, but what happens is, is as you go down that funnel, things get narrower as you get closer to Jesus because he won't allow us. He won't, he won't, he won't allow us to have other lovers. He's a jealous God. And he's jealous because he loves us, not because he's, he's warped. He's jealous because his love is pure. And he says, I'm sorry, that's not good for you. And, so he, and we're forced to let go. But what I find is, is, if we come at it this way, you find people who say things like this, and you've heard it, I'm sure, because I've heard it my whole life. Oh, I tried Jesus, but it didn't work for me. Oh, yeah, I tried that Christianity thing, but this didn't work out. Yeah, I used to do the church gig, but no, I just kind of, and they drop out. They fall away, and they end up angry with God. They end up resenting God because they see God at the narrow end of that funnel as stripping away things that they love or that they need, when all the while, all he's trying to do is bring us to life. He's trying to bring us through the gate. Now, imagine the arrow just goes the other direction. You just flip it around, and now you've got that narrow gate. But it opens up into life. So I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to leave everything at the cross of Christ. I'm going to say that Jesus Christ is indeed the only name given among men whereby we might be saved, that this is my decision. He will be Lord of my life and gets to make every decision. And as I walk through the narrowness of that decision, I'm leaving off every other choice for this one, then suddenly it opens up, the scripture says, into life. Now, see, what happens is when we go the other direction, we think, oh, I'm going to go the broad way because I like, I like my options open. I want to be able to do what I want, see who I want, sleep with what I want, ingest what I want, all of these things. And we think that is freedom. But the reality is those things capture us and lead us to destruction. What feels like a free choice at the beginning, I'm going to drink what I want, turns into I have to drink. I, I have to have this thing to function. And it leads us, it's a trap. That's exactly what a crab trap is, right? Have you ever seen a crab trap? It starts with an easy way to get in, an impossible way to turn around and go the other direction. Where Christ is just the opposite. He's like, actually, it's hard to get in. It's hard in that you have to leave everything else behind. But once in, it opens up all of your life to freedom. Some people don't find this to be true until circumstances have put them in a narrow place. They've landed at bottom, or they've heard the jail door slam shut, or the guilty verdict come down, or the bankruptcy deal finish, or the mate walk out and say, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And that's funny, because all of a sudden, again, in my career, those people reappear in church. And I'm, I, I'm glad they're there. I welcome them. 
But some of us are just more stubborn than others, right? We don't freely let go. It has to be torn out of our hands. But the God who does it, that's the thing we can't get our minds around. The God who does it wants the very best for us, but we can't see that because we can't trust him. That's, a, that's coming in just a second. So you may be sitting here thinking, well, wait a minute. What about the scriptures like in Matthew 11? where Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary, and, and I will give you rest. Doesn't that kind of sound all-inclusive? It's all, it sounds pretty all-inclusive. Come unto me, all you who are weary. It is. Mm-hmm. The invitation is, is very broad. If you're weary and you want rest for your soul, Jesus says, come unto me. Jesus, on the last day of the feast in John 7, stands up and said, if anyone is thirsty, anyone, sounds very broad, very all-inclusive. If anyone is thirsty, Come to me and drink. So in one sense, the invitation is broad. And so don't confuse the invitation with the gate. The same Jesus, though, that said those words also said to the rich young ruler, you can, you have to, there's one thing you lack. Sell everything you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Mm-hmm. That same Jesus said to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, lady, you don't know what you're worshiping because salvation is of the Jews. And this man you're with now is not your husband. So Jesus puts his finger on the one thing that's keeping them from getting through the gate, right? The money and her, her, her guy friend or whatever. And he's saying, if you'll let go, you'll come through the gate. Mm-hmm. But that's a very difficult thing for her to do. So Jesus is inclusive in the invitation, but it doesn't change the gate. There's lots of reasons why we don't like this, but I think one of the main reasons is, is we, we just want to get along. Right? We mm. want to be seen as accepting. And, and we think, well, you know, that doesn't sound, that sounds like kind of, well, narrow. The word is narrow. It sounds narrow-minded. Uh, but listen, there's a reality here. As appealing as it may sound, say all roads lead to the same destination, try that in your car when you leave here. Just try <laughs> Just get in your car and pick a road and see if that road gets you home. Uh, there's... there's May be a few different ways to get home, but there's only a few. See, if I want to go to Portland, I need to get on I-5 going north. If I get on I-5 going south and say, all roads lead to Portland. Mm-hmm. Right? In this case, no, 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 <laughs> that's going to be a problem for me. That's going to be a huge problem. I, one of my favorite uh, scenes in planes, trains, and automobiles is they get on the road going the wrong way. You remember that? And he's asleep at the wheel and he's going the wrong direction and someone is screaming at him, you're going the wrong way. You can point at that guy and say, oh, what a jerk. How mean he is to yell at people like that. No, he's actually trying to save his life. Right? He's, he's telling him the truth. If you keep down this road, you're going to die. That's not, that's not intolerant. That's loving in that situation. This is a... I didn't mention this in the other services, but I'm going to mention it here. It's free. There's two things. There's two, there's two weapons against us, against this idea. One is what one writer would call ugly orthodoxy. That is, the messenger is narrow. The messenger is bigoted. The messenger is mean-spirited. The messenger is the block. You know what I mean? The messenger is the one who I can't get past. I, I kind of like the message, but the messenger is such a fill in the blank, right? So you have ugly orthodoxy, and it obscures the beautiful orthodoxy of the gospel. The other thing is an attractive heresy. This is where the messenger is wonderful, but his message is awful. But he just wants so much for, for everybody to like him, and he wants us all to be together and, and around the Christmas table and just love one another that we're willing to put up with just about anything, right? Mm-hmm. Both of those are very dangerous, dangerous options. And here comes Jesus in the middle mm-hmm. with, this, with this, this Jesus road. There's a ditch, if you will, on both sides of the road. And here comes Jesus with this Jesus road. So here's the question, because you probably ought to be asking yourself here, well, which road am I on? That's a great question. Well, he kind of addresses that in the very next binary choice when he talks about fruit. And he starts out with prophets, but he's testing fruit here. He says this, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. What a picture, right? By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. 
Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. <laughs> Over the years, uh, I think that in, 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 as a pastor, I, I think that's our call. Those of us who are pastors in this room, and, and maybe you, I, I think our, if you think a pastor, what he does is he oversees, he takes care of sheep. We're not to lord it over. We're not, we're not the most important people in the room, but we have a function to play. And so I think there's pastors in the room, and I think there's sheep in the room. It's not a value thing. It's just mm-hmm. our function in, in our world and our community. But I, over the years, I found sheep, uh, wolves in sheep clothing. I found people that come into the flock who are predatory in their nature. In other words, they're here to take. Some of it's blatant and some of it's not. So we've had to have some very difficult conversations over the years with people because their behavior with the sheep is not healthy. Uh, and I mean, it's not, a, it's not something we talk about a lot up front, but church discipline. There have been times where I've had to say to people, I'm sorry, you've got to find a different place because you're not here to bless, you're not here to participate, you're not here to, to, to add, you're here you're predatory in your nature. You're, you're selling something or you're wanting something that uh, you're not here for the good. And, and so Jesus is warning us. He's not, he, he, it's interesting, he doesn't say they're gonna walk right in and announce their presence. I'm a wolf, welcome me. <laughs> no, he says they're dressed as sheep. They're in sheep's clothing, but Jesus said, be careful. And if you watch close enough, watch your life. Over the years, I've watched doctrine. I watched doctrine that, that had kernels of truth to it, that had grains of truth to it, that had potential, but it's just been twisted and, and, and for personal gain. Uh, I, I, and on the mission field, I've watched doctrines that began in America that through the power of television and media got broadcast and, and twisted and, 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 and become these damaging doctrines, these self-absorbed doctrines that damn people's faith, that shipwreck their faith. Those are wolves in sheep clothing. They're taking a piece of the truth but they're twisting it for personal gain. And Paul warned in the book of Acts, as he was leaving, as he said goodbye, he warned his followers, the early church, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. You cannot make peace with a wolf. Oh, I'm just gonna domesticate you and you're gonna sleep on the foot of my bed. You cannot, you can... That caught me off guard. I'm, I'm not going to lie. You can. <laughs> It'll be fine. You can trust me. You cannot make peace with a wolf. A wolf is never going to change. A wolf is, is, is dead in their sin. They may have a veneer of orthodoxy, a veneer of something, but a wolf is a wolf. And Jesus said, be careful. Be careful. In this instance, what the, he has used the words prophet, right? Prophets have a message. They have a message. So there are some messages that simply don't belong in the gospel. And, and that's a reality. Not everything is truth. That's syncretism. The idea of, oh, I'm in a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No, there are some things that we draw a circle around and we say, I'm sorry, that, that doesn't belong in the gospel. You are now crossing into cult territory. You're crossing into untruth, and it's a dangerous place to be. Now, he goes on to describe in this next place two claims that that this is why it's dangerous. Not because, like if this is just a matter of, oh, you believe what you want to believe, I'll believe what I want to believe, hey, we're fine, we'll all get along. Well, maybe we can get along in some areas, but here's why it's dangerous. He says this, these two claims, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. This, in my opinion, some of the scariest scripture in the Bible. And, and listen, we ought to be sobered by it. We, we should pay close attention to what Jesus is saying here because he's not speaking to strangers. He's, he's speaking to people who have heard the word who at least know to call him Lord, Lord. But he's saying here that that simply is not enough. And here's what he goes on to elaborate that makes it even scarier. He says, they can call me Lord, Lord, but they will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then he goes on. Here's the many, the broad way. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. And there's so much happening here in the scripture. Mm. Listen, they, these, these speakers seem to have some sort of relationship they feel like with God. They're like, they're, they know him by name. 
They, they are actually performing miracles, prophesying. It doesn't say that they were actually false prophets. They were prophesying. They weren't rebuked for prophesying. They weren't rebuked for doing miracles. They weren't rebuked for those things. They were rebuked for one thing only, not doing the will of the Father, right? Only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So that means we can actually do good things that still aren't the will of the Father, We have to have a relationship with God where we hear his voice. The scripture says the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice and and obey it. They don't just hear it, but they obey it. And they did all of these things in his name, in his name, in his name. But his rebuke at the end is, I never knew you. Let's unpack that for a second. Is there anyone, anyone that God doesn't know? What does he mean here when he says, I don't know you? Does God not know every name on the planet and and knows you down to every hair on your head? So there's something else going on here than just knowing who you are. He's talking about the personal relationship. The knowing, like, it's not enough to say, oh, I I know that person, but I've never actually talked to them. I just know who they are. We can fake a relationship with people. I I get, you know, you get People Magazine and think you know some celebrity because you know their kids' names and you realize where they went on vacation. You don't know them. And that's what he's saying here. Like, you, you never actually knew me, and I never knew you because you never opened up to me. I used a word earlier called, uh, the word was predator. A wolf is a predator. A wolf thinks about one thing, about consuming its prey for its own belly. And that's what wolves do. They're acting in line with their design and I mentioned when people come in here and I see a predatory nature, it's usually sexual or financial or ambitional. It's something that they want to consume. Again, sexual, financial, ambition, personal ambition. They want to consume something for their own belly. And Jesus says the mark, the mark of a follower, in fact, one of his followers, the one who would follow him to the cross and to his death, the writer John in his epistle says these words. Here's how we can be sure that we know God in the right way. That we know. There's this word intimacy. This, this word know is not, a, not an intellectual knowing. It's an intimacy knowing. It's, it's like the knowing of your husband, the knowing of your wife. If someone claims, I know him well, I have intimacy with Jesus, but doesn't keep his commandments, John says, he's obviously a liar. His life doesn't match his words. But the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure that we're in God. So keep it in context. Remember what Jesus is saying. He said, by their fruit, you will know them. So look at the fruit. That's, you have every right. As you look at us, as, if you look at our lives as pastors, you have, you have every right. I invite you to examine the fruit. You're not going to find perfection in us. If you look close enough, follow us around long enough, you won't see perfection. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about a perfect life here. We're talking about which direction we're facing. You know, if you have ever had an orchard or anything like that, you realize there's good years and bad years. And so there's, there's ups and downs, right? But it's an orchard. It, it, it's going to produce fruit. And Jesus said, we're going to stick with this. We're facing the right direction but if you see a consistency in the way we treat our wives, an, uh, an inconsistency uh, of, 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 of the way we deal with our finances, the way we deal with our relationships, the way we deal with you, you have, you have every right to inspect the fruit. And that's not, that's not judging, that's discerning. That's what we talked about last week. There's a difference between judging and discerning, right? And for someone to, to react, well, hey, no one has a right to judge. We judge all the time. And that was last week. You can pick it up on, the, on, our, on our website link, right? But, but listen, Jesus said, no, no, by your fruit, that's the way you're going to know. Do they obey the words of Jesus? Do they reflect the character of Jesus? Do they reflect in the places where it counts? Not on a stage somewhere. That's easy. That could be just performance. But in their private lives with people who know them the best. If your mother doesn't know you've been born again, good chance are you haven't. <laughs> Sorry. I like that test. That's yeah. a good test. If the people closest to you don't recognize a change in your life, you really should take another look at your life. Yeah. Sorry if that sounds strong. <laughs> so here he comes to uh, this ultimate analogy, this ultimate picture. And, uh, and we've heard it so often. Matter of fact, we even started the whole sermon series with this. We, we put this at the this front number because four. it's so important. Uh, we've, we've heard it so often, we've turned it into a kid's song. The wise man built his house upon the rock, <laughs> right? 
You know, you don't know. Oh my goodness, you guys got to go back to kids' church. It's Come great. On. The rains came down and the floods came mm-hmm. up. Yeah. yeah all Some right. of you are with it. Right. Very good. Yeah. I like that. It's awesome. <laughs> There's two builders in this story, and he describes them thus. Therefore, he says, and this is an extremely important therefore, because he's built on all of five, six, and seven. Therefore, everything I've said since the beginning of the Beatitudes until now, everything he said about relationships, about love, about enemies, about, about marriage, everything he says now, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, every word I've spoken of mine, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. There's the promise. There's the promise. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, not when the rain came, just the rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. What is is Jesus doing here? Is he like trying to just scare people into the kingdom? I I don't think so. I think he's making a statement. It's interesting in this last piece, Mm -hmm. the commonalities are are, are there. We're talking about they both had a house. They both had builders. They both endured a storm. Mm -hmm. The only difference in the story was the foundation. And if you read it again, if we're reading it in context, we see the foundation is is the obedience piece, this Mm -hmm this relationship piece with Jesus. I lived in the Caribbean for just a brief stint in missions, and uh, when storms would come through, they would name the storms to keep track because there were so many in the hurricane season, right? So they Hurricane Jason, Hurricane Helen, Hurricane, and they would name these storms, right? And they would, they would categorize, oh, it's a, it's a level four, it's a level five, and you knew, hey, if it's level five, it's time to batten down the hatches. It's funny today how people... Uh, you know, you've, you, you watched the fires in, in, uh, in Tennessee just a few weeks ago, or you watched the floods in New Orleans, and, and you have rescue workers banging on people's doors. You need to go to high ground. You need to get out of the house. You need to evacuate. And people won't do it. What are they doing? What are those rescue workers doing? Like, are they working on commission or something? No. They're trying to scare you to safety. There, are, they, are they frightful words? Yes. But wouldn't it be worse if they said, no, nah, just hang out here, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> You're all going to die. <laughs> no. They're speaking strong words. They're speaking almost words that stir you, frighten you. <gasps> like, leave my house, leave my belongings. Yeah, but they're trying to scare you to safety. I believe Jesus is trying to scare us to Doctors safety. have to do this all the time, and, and they'll get burnt out and frustrated on it because they're telling me, dude, listen to me. If you keep on in this lifestyle, you will not make it 10 more years. And then they see people kind of laugh it off and go away, and they don't see him again until they're dying. And, and the, re, the difference between just a scare tactic and this is this is reality. A scare tactic is, inflates the problem, right? It makes it bigger than it actually is. No, this is just, hey, you're going the wrong way. You, you, you are going to die if you keep this up. This isn't about, being, about creating fear. This is about cre- creating reality and helping you to see reality. Now, the reality is the two groups of people that are the two builders that Jesus is talking about here is not people who hear the word of God and people who do not hear the word of God. We, we tend to hear this story and think, oh, I'm one of the, I'm one of the you know, I've got my foundation, I'm fine. And then there's those people that don't come to church and they, they've built on sand. Mm-hmm. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about people who hear the word of God in both instances. That if, if, if we could bring this in... in in our terms, they're both churchgoers. They, they share the same pew. But one of them hears and obeys, and one of them only hears. That's why this is scary, because the reality is that's possible. And we all know it because we've all discovered that part of our life. Like, oh, you know what? I thought I was a Jesus follower, and then I, I realized there's this whole part of my life that's completely out of sync with his will. And, and I don't, how have I not seen this until now? And that's where the ongoing repentance continues to take place in a Christian's heart. You're like, oh man, I thought I was all good and here it is. And his godly conviction moves us to repentance and gives us life. Isn't it amazing that 
a hurricane of a certain level in one part of the world will do one level of destruction. The same level hurricane in another part will do massive destruction. Mm -hmm. Same thing with an earthquake. Mm -hmm. Well, why is that? They use the same building materials. The big difference is the foundation. So you may be sitting here and thinking, well, man, my life has been pretty sweet, problem-free. Maybe a little rain here and there, but never a hurricane. Like I said, they name them Hurricane Doubt. You hit a stage in your life, you get around some really sharp university professors and they just shred the faith. They shred your beliefs, your, your childhood Christian beliefs, they shred them because you don't, they shred what you know and you realize, man, my foundation was shallow. And all of a sudden, your life at 24 years of age is filled with doubt, and you walk away from the faith. Well, a hurricane temptation. Like, oh, yeah, I've, I've been fine. I never, you know, I've, my faith is strong, and then suddenly an opportunity that's never been there before suddenly arises, and all the self-control that you thought you had just feels like it's down to level zero. Like, what is going on? Hurricane tragedy. Life was rolling along and everything was great and it was easy to praise the Lord and raise your hands and worship and tragedy hits and you found yourself. Man, where did that come from? That came from so far out in left field, I never saw it. I never saw it coming. The death of a baby, sickness of an adult, the car crash that you never imagined. And all of a sudden, where was God? Where is God now? Your faith. See, it's, this is about our faith. This is a fight for our faith. Hurricane divorce, hurricane bankruptcy. You can just fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. But it's this testing of your faith that every writer and every man and woman of God for centuries has warned us and admonished us. Hey, dig deep. Put the foundation in there. Because according to Jesus, it's not a question of if the storm will come. It's a question of one day. And the last one is hurricane hurricane death. Mm -hmm. Think about it. The hurricane of physical death sweeps away everything. And no one in this room, myself included, no one escapes. No one, you may have, you may have gotten by hurricane temptation and hurricane uh, uh, tragedy and hurricane this and that, but no one's, gonna, no, one, no one's gonna get away from hurricane death. It sweeps away everything. All my wealth goes to another. All my education, all those accolades, everything I've earned, is, it's gone. It's the end of my life. You may think, well, that's an encouraging Christmas message. It just depends on, it depends on how you look at it because if my foundation is in the eternal kingdom and person of Jesus Christ, then like that funnel, just like that funnel, death is a narrow opening into a life I could have never even imagined. Death is a passageway into life eternal. And man, everything else is just... Just, is, is just imitation, is just the shadow of the greatness to come. Let me say that again. Everything else, every sexual pleasure, every, every, every financial achievement, every educational milestone, every accolade, every powerful position we could ever hope for, all that stuff is a, to the believer is a shadow of what's to come. But some people who live their lives and give their lives to the shadow instead of the substance. The substance, folks, is an eternal kingdom to come. Ask the worship team to go ahead and come back up as we close here. The, the final verses of uh, these three chapters mm. of the greatest sermon that's ever been preached because it's preached by the word of God. The word made flesh gave us this message. This isn't, these final words, though, aren't his own. They're the observers. The, the gospel writer himself and the others that were there, they recognized something. Mm. There was something different about this message than any other message they'd heard. And these were religious people who'd heard their, mm. their, their entire life, had heard message after message, story after story, that had memorized huge swaths of, of the Old Testament. But this is what they had to say about this message. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because... He taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. See, there's authority that has taken place here in Jesus' speaking that was beyond anything they'd ever seen before. The other people that spoke with authority, they, they literally wore their authority like robes. 
right? When a cop pulls you over and he's got the badge and you see him on the street or wherever, you're like, okay, I understand that is a man of authority. When he's dressed down and he doesn't have and he tries to pull the authority card, you're like, who are you? What are you why are you telling me to slow down? Like, well, actually, and then they show you the authority again. Oh, okay, all right. He didn't have to wear the authority like that. You know why? Because he has the authority of the author. He wrote the book. Mm. He wrote the story. He wrote creation. He was there at the beginning. All of the words are his. He is the only one, like the, like the author, who has the ability to change the story. No one else can. Everyone else is just commentary. He writes the story. That, that is the authority I want in my life. I want to talk to the author of creation about how to do life. If it's true, then it changes everything. If it's not true, then it's all insignificant. Just find some place where you can feel good about yourself, feel comfortable. But if it's true, then it really is a matter of life and death. Someone said there's a lot of good religions and beliefs to live by, but the test is whether you can die by yours. And so in this last verse, I believe Jesus throws down this authority card. If you read the context and you read on in Matthew 8 and 9, what you find is Jesus goes out and heals the sick, casts out demons, calms the storm. So what he's saying is, I'm Lord over life and death and circumstances. I, I have the authority over all those things. But he still, at the end of the day, leaves the choice with us and says, choose this day who you'll serve. And I would encourage you to choose, but to examine the one who calls you. Don't just, don't, just, don't just choose blindly because we have kind of, kind of preached you this direction. Or don't choose blindly because you want your parents to approve of you or you want, this, you want to finally get this person to finally marry you because you've become a Christian. No, choose because you've looked square in the face of all the evidence. Look square in the face of the one who calls you. Look at his character. Look at his history. Look at his teachings. Look at his behavior. And then ask yourself, is the one who calls me worthy to be totally obeyed and trusted with my whole life? That's the es essence of the gospel right there. Is the one who calls me worthy to be trusted with my whole life? My whole life, not just pieces of it. Not just Sunday, but Monday through Saturday. This is the one who calls you. We, we declare to you this morning that he is good. And he is wise. Is he always comfortable? No. Fathers, we finished this morning. Show us the baggage that for some reason we have a death grip on thinking if we let go of it our lives will be less. As we finish I'd like for you to just take a few minutes, just a minute here as we finish and ask that question. Father, are there things that I have a grip on that are weighing me down but I can't let go because I'm afraid? That if I do let go, I'll be less or I'll suffer or I'll be alone. fun will be over. Father, show me what I value more than you. And put those things in my life in order. Mm -hmm. 
Take a second, would you, and let the Lord speak to you here this morning. Do you know his voice? Do you know his ways? Do you know his character? could be a day of shift for you. A seismic shift in the direction of your life. Obey what the Lord asked you to do. He's worthy to be trusted. His history with you has been nothing but faithful.